Well, as you guys know, there's been a lot of conversation about the whole SYSBM situation. And there have been many perspectives. And definitely from, from my point of view, particularly since I have done quite a bit of travel, have traveled in Central America, have traveled in Africa, and about the United States as well, I thought I could also add a perspective to this conversation. One thing I would say is that I find it very adolescent that men are telling other men where, where they can go to find the pleasures or the outcomes that they want out of life. I find that to be very adolescent. That's kind of like teenage stuff. Don't go here, come over here with me. Yo, are you a punk for going over there? But to think that every man that travels overseas is somehow lacking in his ability to have women or be with women in the United States, I think that is, that is nonsensical. Because men make choices for so many different reasons for the reasons why they might want to choose one thing over another. But I would say, you know, with regard to the American culture, American culture is a very unique culture. And American culture in Black America is more unique than the broader American culture in the United States. So as that pertained to dating, I think we have a, a very unique dynamic within ourselves, how we date both black women and black men. And from the perspective where women in general have had an advantage for the past 50 or more years, or some might even say 60 years, they have used that advantage whether it be through feminism, womanism, or just overall general rights and opportunities within the society, they have changed the landscape. And the change have been significant. It hasn't been a small change. Women's power have continued to rise throughout society. And both black women and white women, for that matter, and they have been setting the tone to the new rules of dating. They have changed the rules to suit themselves. Unfortunately, they still want the best, the best men to provide and spend money on them. That hasn't changed. So in a sense, there are some basic things as it pertains to the patriarchy that women do prefer. And in, in reality, that is a standard around the world with regard to women wanting men to provide. In different countries, those standards may fluctuate. But in general, when a man goes out into society, and he takes a woman out, it's expected that he will carry the bill. He'll pay the freight. Now, we, do, we know that most countries that are non-Western, whether it's in the Latin countries or in the Eastern countries or the Mediterranean East, Middle East countries, those are patriarchal by, by nature. They have maintained the old traditional ways of patriarchy. And I don't think that those countries hate women. They love their women and they protect their women and they take care of their women. The problem that I find is that 
femininity is something that has become a negotiable asset in Western countries, and in particularly in America. When you go overseas, femininity is on full display. A woman is sensitive, they're caring, they commu communicate with you. To the degree that they're interested in you, they will communicate with you very openly. Not so much in the US. In the US, those standards have changed. Femininity is like on demand, almost like a cable service that's provided by Comcast. You have to pay for it on demand. And to the degree of how much of it you get may determine how much you can pay. That's negotiable to some people, but nonetheless. If you want a woman that's not masculine, that you don't have to subdue, like the other night, three or four days ago, I was on another channel and we were having a conversation and one of the guys said on that channel that you have to be able to subdue a black woman. So I was like, what do you mean subdue a black woman? Like, you mean like if you have a dog, you gotta train her, you gotta teach her to sit, stay, obey. You know, that's crazy because women today said that they want to be treated with some level of respect. And I understand that. That's a normal human thing. But if you have to break a woman mentally in some way to get her to submit to you, that's a whole different conversation. You should be able to talk to a woman, express to you, express to her what you want out of that relationship or that encounter. And if she's down with you, she say yay or nay. If it's a long-term relationship you're looking for, you take it stages by stages. You get to know each other, you go out, you date for a while, obviously sex will play into that relationship at some point. And then you see if that relationship have legs. If it does, it can continue. If it doesn't, you know, nature will take its course and each individual will move on. I just think that men are not looking for a lot of the psychological head games that women play today. If you can't just express yourself without trying to figure out what's her next move, it becomes too time consuming and time wasting, especially for individuals who, you know, got it going on. Men who are successful or moving towards success, they're multitaskers. They're cognizant of their time. They're aggressive. They have tasted what it's like to win. And if you've ever won something in life, you know what that feels like. And you want to be able to replicate that as often as you can. One thing you don't deal with when you're dealing with women overseas you're not dealing with an adversarial partner or person. That's like a US phenomenon where the person you're dating is like an adversary to you and you have to like conquer them. Uh, yes, there is, a, there is a mating dance, but the mating dance is not where you have to literally break the woman like she was a, a stallion and you have to ride her until she breaks in. No. 
there's a whole different dynamic when you're dealing with women from other countries. And I think the fact that brothers in mask are now experiencing that and coming back and talking about what that experience have been like. I mean, obviously, the sexual piece is a big piece because maybe some men have have not had a woman be so open to them before without, without you being so prying to get her to open up where you can just sit down, have a conversation, and if a woman is into you, next minute you know she's stroking your forehead. She's rubbing her hands behind your ear. She's touching you to let you know, I like you. I'm interested in you. She's relieving the anxiety because there is a lot of anxiety when you're getting to know someone and you're dating a person. So all these things, when you're overseas, you don't get this obstruction at every turn in the getting to know stage. Don't get me wrong. I do understand that some brothers, or maybe many brothers, do date for sexual tourism when they travel. But that's a very small percentage of most countries' travel program and what the country offers and the activities that's available. For example, I mean, I can give you my experience. Like when I first went to Africa, I was in Bamako. My second day after I got there, and I knew the owner of the hotel, it was actually, he was the brother to the prime minister, and they owned several hotels uh, in the country. And I was introduced to him. So I asked him, I said, hey, you know, I want to get to know, to know the city a bit. Who can I get to show me around? And he gave me the name of a, of a good taxi. I called up the taxi. He came, he picked me up. And for like three or four hours to show you around, it's not expensive. See, that's one of the beautiful things when you have American currency and you exchange it into foreign currency, your money goes longer. And what, you, what I was able to do Instead of going out in the sexual areas of the city, the cab driver showed me all the top restaurants, all the top clubs, what day is the good, best day to go out when ladies come out to party, where you can go shopping, where all the major malls are, where the place to give you good cultural food, the downtown areas to shop. I mean... If you want to get to know a country real well, a local taxi is the best way to go because they know all the places and they're going to show you around and give you all the heads up. And if he works nights or have a partner that works nights, then you have a taxi you can use in the daytime and you have a taxi you can use when you want to, when you want to hang out. And that's just something that I've learned over the years that I just don't regulate myself just to the American tourism spots where it's safe, but also the night spots there are always one or two night spots where are treated for where women will come to deal with American men. If you want to meet the women that you're not going to have to pay for, where you're going to meet women that are just socializing in the country like they normally do, so you're going to have to go where they are. And I've found over the years that it's far better to be generous when you're out and about. And because your money goes a long way, tipping well can get you favors. And the best way to get favors, money, money by familiarity, money by access, money open doors. I mean, we see it in America, but we see it in America with larger sums. 
tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and more. But in other countries where your few thousands or tens of thousands, and for those who have hundreds of thousands, you definitely get a, a whole different level of access. One of the things I would say that you don't want to be perceived as is being cheap. Like in Honduras, if you're cheap, they call you tacaño, right? You'll see people do that. If they, they don't even say the word. They'll just motion to their friends about you. And that'll tell everybody, he's a cheap dude. The guys know, the waiters know, the manager know, the girls know. Everybody know he's cheap. You never want to be perceived, even in America. I mean, I learned that in the U.S. But uh, particularly when you're traveling, you don't want to come off like you're a cheap guy. Because people are going to treat you different if you're perceived as being cheap versus if you're perceived as being uh, generous, nice. Because when you're, when you're generous, people automatically assume he's a nice guy. She's a nice person. I remember uh, back in the day, this was years ago in the mid to early 90s when I really was hanging out at some big spots, right? If you go into a spot and you know it's a spot that's got a reputation, it has well-to-do people who frequent the location, many women will be there. When you go to a spot like that, for me, what I used to do, I used to order you know, a regular drink. My drink at that time was Kettle One Vodka, Kettle One Citron on the rocks. It was $25 or $30, depending on the place. I will order that drink, and I will pay with 100 and I will tell the waiter, not so much the waiter, the bartender, because I order direct from the bar. I'll tell the bartender, keep the change. They'll look at you twice to be sure. Say, yeah, keep the change. You kind of brush it off, walk away, pick up your drink. What does that do? You know what that does? And I'm going to ask the chat, particularly the men. When you approach a female bartender and you order a drink and you give her a sizable tip on the first transaction, what are you actually looking to get? There are three different benefits that you get from tipping like that. And it doesn't mean that every drink you buy, you're going to tip like that. But the first drink you buy, you tip it like that. What is that purpose? Drop it in the chat. Let me see who is really either who have had that experience or, okay, I see Shamar says great service. That's one. There are three benefits. What's the other? The next time, no, it's obviously the next time may come into effect, but I'm talking about that night, your first time at that place. Reputation, that's big, yes, reputation. And the next thing? Access. Complimentary service? Well, it's a little more than complimentary service. What you have is access. That waitress will keep her eyes on you throughout the night. When a place gets crowded and you're in a hot spot, you don't need to be fighting your way trying to get to the bar to get a drink. Especially if you meet a young lady there later and you're having a good conversation. All you want to do is be able to face the bar, raise your hand, She's going to spot you. She already know your drink. You can tell her to, or you can just yell out if you're buying a drink for somebody else. She's going to get you a drink right away. And all you got to do is reach through the guys that are standing around waiting to get her attention. You get immediate service. That's what you're buying. You're buying reputation. You're buying a quality of service. And you're buying access. And those three things will get you a long way. When you have reputation at a place, there's nothing better. When you take a woman out, 
whether you're sitting down for dinner or you're just there for drinks, the way the service treats you is going to cause her to look at you in a certain way. She's going to be like, who are you? Why are you getting all this special service? Why are people treating you like that? Why are everybody so nice to you? She's going to be trying to figure out who you are. What is it about you that other people treat you so good? And I think today, the way men, and I guess maybe I, I kind of miss the era of brokeism. I, I miss that era because I came up in an era and I came up with guys, even in my hustling days before I got into business, before I got out of high school and went into business. All the crews I hung out with, they had money. They treated each other well. We went to nice places. We bought and wear good stuff. And when I went into the business world, I was exposed to men who had a certain class about them. And they taught me different things on how to socialize. Some of these men were from England. I worked in engineering in the first part of my life. I used to work with a lot of British guys. And then later when I went on Wall Street, you know, it was just general American men, white men. And what I'm saying is that I think as men, we, we have not really learned a certain social etiquette and how to really treat people. We kind of rough around the edges. We're rude to people. And people in service, they make their living from, you know, from service. So, you know, if, you, if 100 people treat them like shit and you're the one person to treat them good, they're going to remember you. They're going to remember you. It's not. It's it's very similar to when I first when I first came to Honduras. I went to a particular restaurant, and uh, my one of my favorite dishes is fried fish because here it is. You know, it's seafood is everywhere, so I used to like getting a nice good pound and a half or two pound uh, pescado. That's red fish, red snapper. So I would order a red fish with rice and beans, and tajadas, which is like fried plantains. And I just had enough to pay for the dinner in the local currency, which was like maybe 150 pesos, which was like maybe seven bucks. And I wanted to give the girl a tip, but I only had US money. And the smallest denomination I had was a five. So I gave it a $5 bill as a tip. Not really realizing the exchange, that was like 90 to 95% of my bill in the tip. But to say, whenever I came back to that restaurant, I just got phenomenal service. And on Fridays and Saturday nights, they used to have live band with dinner and all different types of stuff. So if I brought a date with me, it was just, I got the best seat in the house, right near to the band on the left. You know, the nice place where you can sit where the speakers are not in your face, but you can see the stage real well. You get good service. You get your drinks on time. I mean, there's just so much by learning how to be generous that it can advance the quality of the, your social part, part of your life, right? And I think with this younger brother who's been getting a lot of, I get a lot of pushback. What's his name? Uh, Hollerman? What's the, boy, what's the brother name? Andrew or Andre or Andy? I'm not sure of his first name. Somebody might want to type it in the chat. But Hollerman, he made this uh, video where he's been talking about going overseas. And obviously, he's a classy kid. He's not an ugly dude. He definitely shows that he has the ability to gain the attention of women and take women out. Austin. Thanks a lot, Marcus. Austin. And, that's, and, and the point is, is that Men today, I think we're waking up. Black men, we're always the last of the party, right? But we know how to turn a party out once, once we're there. Thanks, Brian. Uh, going out, socializing, and deciding what it is that we want out of life is more than just a, one woman or one type of woman. Life is about variety and quality. And I think finally black men are starting to broaden their sights and looking, we're looking at the world as a planet, 
as opposed to just looking at the world as the United States. And I think for those men who have that ability to think that way, and then who has the economics to actually exercise their intentions, those men are going to see a much different outcome in their life. Not just immediately today, but it's gonna shape their worldview. Passport bros, exactly. It's gonna shape their worldview on a whole different level. Another thing I've been hearing a lot of talk about is this whole tricking, you know, because spending money on a woman is tricking. Well, spend, if you don't spend money on a woman, it's because you're broke, because you can't afford to. Men who have it, do it. Because money, for most men who have money, money is just a tool. It's nothing, it's not, it's no more than having a hammer, a chisel, and a wrench. It's suitable for the tool that you want to get the job done that you're looking to get fulfilled. Meaning, if you want to be able to get access to certain places, you need money because most of the times you have to get an invitation. And it depends on your circle as you go up in income, as your tax bracket change, your social status usually change with it. And as you get to know different type of people, they'll talk to you about things that are common to them that is new to you. And you'll be like, what are you talking about? And they say, you don't know about that? Then they'll drop a bug in your ear. Oh, you know what? You need to come by this address on Thursday after five o'clock. I'll be there. Just come on by, we'll show you around. And that's how you wind up getting access to places. And many a times it's not just socializing, it's business. Because particularly in America, business is done socializing. Business is not done only in the boardroom or through a telephone or on a computer. That's usually just introductory. That's just trying to get your feet in the door to have the conversation. But when you want to close those big deals, a lot of times those big deals may require some kind of social get together. And the reason I wanted to kind of like touch on this whole tricking thing is because how can I say my background is in financial services. I've spent many years working on Wall Street trading, uh, both in equities and commodities. I had a really big buddy who used to trade for a big bank. He used to trade uh, Brent Oil out of London. So we were, you know, we were good friends, Asian brother. In any event, you know, for me, when I look at things, sometimes I see it through the color of my expertise. And I, I look at how men deal with women in three different categories. I have what you call the day trader approach. The day trader is really cash for service, quid pro quo. I pay you for X, you give me Y. That's what some brothers who go overseas, you know, for sex travel, that's their arrangement. They're paying for a service that they want. But then you also have guys who are short-term holds. They might hold the stock for six months, a year, maybe a little more than a year, a year or two, but it's not a long-term haul. That type of situation is your girlfriend, your relationship, a woman that you might date for six months, a year or two, she might be your woman. And then you have what I call the long-term investment, the blue chip woman. The blue chip woman is your long-term girl. That's the woman that you plan on marrying.